Peter, thanks so much for being here. I never thought I would start a conversation by saying, tell me about the conceptual penis, but tell me about <laughs> the conceptual penis. <laughs> uh, the conceptual penis rises again. It's actually one of the most cited papers, according to Google Scholar, in, in gender studies or uh, in, in the top tier of cited papers. Yeah. So the conceptual penis following in the footsteps of Alan Sokol, who was a and or is still an NYU math and physics professor wrote a hoax paper and he submitted to to the number one postmodern journal in the world. It was basically gibberish nonsense, and he was concerned that they were misappropriating scientific terms, particularly for political purposes. So he wrote this paper to expose that. So the conceptual penis follows in Alan Sokol's footsteps, and it's a more or less, it's not a gibberish paper, but it certainly has a lot of gibberish in there, a lot of, a lot of vulgarities for the penis. And we basically argue that penises are constructs. And while there may be, <laughs> while there may be actual penises that we, we detail all the terrible things for which penises <laughs> uh, are guilty, and among those is climate change. So it's, it's a, it was a hoax paper and we did an expose in Skeptic Magazine about it designed to show that there were problems in certain bodies of literature or were certain types of thoughts, things that are morally fashionable. What is the problem that you're trying to tease out with the hoax? Well, even if I may step back before that, so we, we published this paper and so many people said, this paper doesn't do what you think it does. If, if you really wanna show that there's a problem that it, the scholarship is not rigorous, that it's ideologically based, that there are, um, it's not tethered to reality, there's insufficient evidence for these claims. What you really need to do is you need to do A, B, C, D, E. So, okay, let's do A, B, C, D, E. So my writing partner and I did exactly, they gave us a roadmap and we followed the roadmap to a T. You need to publish more papers and more journals and you need to make certain kind. We just thought we did everything they told us to do. So uh, the purpose of it, and we wrote it up in Aereo Magazine, was to expose the bankruptcy of, of much of the scholarship that's coming out of these fields and that's informing public policies. And what are the fields that you're targeting that you're worried about? Almost everything with the word studies in it. <laughs> that's a lot. What, is the, what does one form of studies have in common with another form of studies that's problematic? They're ideologically based. They're not, they start with their conclusions first and they work backward. That's not the way science works. That's not the way evidence ought to work. You ought to have- right, But the cultural studies professor might say, well, that's because it's not science. It's cultural studies. So it doesn't work according to a scientific method. It, it's, it's all about getting our hands dirty, reading various texts and trying to understand their, their relationship to each other and well, great. how they then interact. Don't, then, don't, then don't claim it's true and don't form, when someone wants to form public policies on it, say, no, 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 this is basically just, these are just our musings. Can you give us examples of things that are held to be true in these disciplines that you think aren't founded on fact? Oh, I, I'll, I'll give you things that, that contradict fact. <laughs> now, one of the papers that we published was, was um, we, we termed it fat bodybuilding. We argued that there should be a classification in professional bodybuilding where they don't use the word morbidly obese, but morbidly obese people can come and display their fat in, in non-competitive ways. And that bodybuilding <laughs> competitions um, need to allow this. Is the fight I originally wrote in the I'm a big Star Trek fan. I wrote this is the final frontier of fat activism to penetrate into the world of professional bodybuilding. And the journal editor was upset at the word final frontier. I took it from the Star Trek reference, but she looked at it as the the um, slaughter of the Native Americans. So a, a great example would be in the journal Fat Studies, for example. The entire journal is predicated on fat acceptance. It's not what people would think. Is it about A1Cs, you know, the amount of sugar you've had in your blood or how many macronutrients you should have or should you intermittent fast? It's about none of that. It's a fat advocacy journal. And so when these 
um, uh, articles come out, the professors assign the art articles in class and test students on these. So they're basically being asked right or wrong answers to things that are factually incorrect. And that's just one small example. But I think it's an example that shows it's directly how these fields can, they're kind of like toxins to people's conceptions of reality, particularly young girls' susceptibility to, they call it healthy at every size. And this, of course, spans not just in terms of body image, but across a whole suite of, I suppose, Correct. cultural type issues, right? And anyone who's done a university course in the past 30 years in, <laughs> is familiar with, like when I was at uni, instead of Australian history, there was a, a subject called Making Australia, which you, where you learned to problematize and complicate traditional narratives of Australian history from the perspective of, of oppressed groups like Indigenous Australians, which is exactly. a perfectly worthwhile thing to do. But I didn't yet know enough Australian history to understand even what we were doing. So we were deconstructing things that hadn't yet been constructed to my 19-year-old mind. Is this just something that universities play around with and always have? No, well, just on that, to, to borrow from Derrida, one of the French intellectuals, Helen Pluckrose has a wonderful piece, How French Intellectuals Ruined the West. Derrida does have a few nuggets. One of the things he says is before you can deconstruct a discipline, you have to know a discipline. So you, you have to understand history. You have to understand the rudiments of what you're talking about before you can attempt any form of deconstruction. So no, they're not playing around with this. This is not fun and games they're teaching these these subjects are being taught and the conclusions that they've come to are being taught as fact and they're being told that this is knowledge and if you want we can talk about idea laundering but Weinstein's phrase uh, after the what he said to me at a party one night and I've, I've published a few pieces about it yeah let's, think, let's let's talk let's talk about that idea laundering what is it so idea laundering is a few people get together, they have an idea about something. And if they're in the academy, if they're academics, then they, they get together and they form a journal. And so they discharge their moral impulses in the journal. So they go in the journal as a feeling, they have a moral feeling or a conclusion, and they come out the other side, they're laundered, they come out as knowledge. So then you have all these disciplines with all of these journals, with all of these articles making claims about reality that are simply not evidence-based. They're not, they're completely disconnected from reality. And the point is that someone can come up with a harebrained idea and by putting it through the process of peer review and getting published in a journal, which in a scientific context carries a lot of weight and, and, and lends it a certain credibility, they're able to make it appear like it's a stronger uh, opinion than it is, or that it's even fact. not n not even in a scientific case. You know that that should be the gold standard of knowledge. With all this disinformation and fake news and what have you, we have to have a source where we can look that we can trust. You know, there's a crisis of confidence in our institutions now. There's a, a legitimacy crisis, and if people can't look to the peer-reviewed literature, then where are they looking to? They're looking through their own ideological sinkholes, right? Their own that they become absorbed and they fall down a rabbit hole. So if you're, so, so you come up with this idea of, you know, this hoax paper, the conceptual penis and these other hoax papers and you submit them and they get published. And then you use that as a way of saying, look, these idiots will publish essentially anything and give it credibility. Isn't not there not anything. I'm gonna interrupt you because this is yes, very, please. very important. This is the linchpin of the whole thing. They won't publish anything. They won't publish papers that contradict the narrative they'll only publish papers that are written in alignment with the dominant moral orthodoxy that they're pushing. That's the kind of papers that they publish. Got it. So, so it's you not that they'll the, publish anything. Right. So you tailored the conceptual penis to inhabit a worldview that you thought would be sympathetic to them, a worldview of patriarchy, a worldview of misogyny, a worldview of the primacy. Well, of a, 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 yes. And more importantly, in this worldview, and I've been doing this for so long and I've read so much literature, I truly at this point understand how they think about things. So for the conceptual penis, everything is a construct. It's all constructs. There's no, it's, that's not to say that there's no objective reality. That's a, a fine a point. They're not denying objective reality. They're just saying that knowledge of, object, ex, um, of objective reality is mediated through power relations and discourse. 
And so part of the worldview is that everything is a construct. So if everything is a construct, well, then the penis must be a construct. Well, if the penis is a construct, what follows from that? Is it not true that our understanding of reality is mediated by power dynamics? Yeah, to a certain extent, it is, sure. That doesn't mean you can't know reality. That doesn't mean, you know, when you go into a bank and, and you want to make change that you're going to say in your reality, it's something different. That doesn't mean that, um, but getting back to the fat studies example, one of the things they want to do to push a worldview or push a narrative, and this has been utterly devastating and it's completely genius, is they change the meaning of words. So for example, in the, in the journal fat studies, they don't use the word obesity. The word obesity is a word that's used within medicine. It's a medical narrative, whereas fat is a descriptor. So they're saying that there are different narratives and they're promulgating, they're pushing, they're forwarding the one narrative where they use the word fat. And then that's a kind of discourse that people, in, in which people engage. Are you noticing a greater abuse of words? Yeah, not only in abusive words, people are completely changing. Th that this is, you can take this for what it's worth. This is my opinion about how this is metastasized throughout our institutions. It's not that they're making up words, they have neologisms or what have you. It's that they're completely changing the meaning of, meanings of words. And they're taking words with a positive valence, changing the meanings of those words, and then, uh, and then instituting policies on the basis of the new meanings of words. What kinds like, of examples? What kinds well, of examples? Yeah. To give you tons of examples. Equity is probably the most prominent, prominent example. Um, most people don't know what equity means. And, and in fact, well, let me, let me rephrase that. Most people have heard of the word equity in terms of, you know, the amount of money you have in a house, if you owe <laughs> the bank, right? So, so they've taken a, a term, it has a positive valence. And um, my kid's school now, everything is equity. My former mm. employer, Portland State University, every, every email, equity, equity, equity. But when you ask people, I was at a faculty department meeting and somebody actually didn't know what equity meant. They looked it up and they said fairness. And they said, well, okay, it just means fairness. And I said, okay, well, you want to use the word fairness. Let's do that. Equity is the opposite of fairness. And it's the absolute antithesis. It's the antithesis of um, equality. Why do you say it's the opposite of fairness? It's, it's, it's often constructed as, a, as uh, indistinct, to make it dis distinct from equality, where people, critics of equality say, well, it's all very well to let everyone start out at the same place, but because of historical injustices and you know, intergenerational trauma and so on, you it's actually important to give people who are falling behind an extra benefit, which is not equality, that would be equity, because that's actually the fairest way to make sure that outcomes are ah. more similar. What, why ah. is that not fair? Because you just, two, two things, did you see how you smuggled in outcomes there? Yeah, I didn't smuggle it in. I intentionally put it in there because that's what they Okay, but about. With the, at no point in the conversation had outcomes previously come in. So equity... Well, I mean, it's, it's relevant to people who think that fairness should be judged by outcomes, not just in inputs. Okay, I guess in that case, I would have to ask um, how they derive their conception of fairness. Is that a rationally derivable conception of fairness? Like on what principle? How, so, you know, if we talk about John Rawls, we could talk about how, how is that notion of fairness... How do we get that notion of fairness? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I'm not the one who's putting, putting forward this idea of fairness, but I think it comes to a lot of people instinctively that if you have a system that is sort of a rigged game where you end up with outcomes that are different for reasons that are trivial, such as, say, the colour of one's skin or one's sex, mm -hmm. then uh, it's fairer to try to modify those outcomes. Okay, so when you I say don't, I, don't, I don't know that you, they're consciously doing a Rawlsian justice theory of justice. Well, well I'm, I'm just saying, in, in other words, I'm trying to differentiate it from, I'm trying to figure out where they get this notion. But okay, but let's just accept that by fiat. But even in that case, that means by definition that some people have to be treated unfairly. By definition. Yes. Okay, yes, so then, you mean the people then, who have the privilege need to be treated unfairly to create space for the unprivileged to end correct. up in the same spot. Yeah. So then equity is by definition not fair. I see. Yes, well, there's a differential treatment, but it depends on how you define fair, as you, as you say, whether or not you're looking at outcomes or only inputs. C correct. Um, tr traditional definitions of fair have, have, I mean, so again, this, these are conversations we're having, we can, 
I'm happy to actually have this conversation. Um, but one thing that I found to kind of bring it up a level, I'll go down with you more if you want, is that people are using um, equity as a synonym for equality, and they're using it as a broad paintbrush for fairness. And I'm saying that, that it's the antithesis of equality, and it's not fair because some people have to be treated differently. Now, if you want to claim that it's fair, for example, to discriminate against Asians on the basis of their admissions to um, universities, particularly in math and sciences, I'd like to hear that argument. I'd, I'd well, like to hear that because it's I equitable, mean, since, but it's not fair. Since we're digging into the kind of what's underpinning the sort of moral philosophy of these conceptions, I had something that's just occurring to me, which is there are clearly differences in people's conceptions about fairness as to whether or not you're looking at group outcomes or individual outcomes. And it strikes me that there's been a shift in recent years from looking at fairness towards individuals to emphasizing fairness among groups. And I wonder whether or not Correct. you can enlighten me on that. Well, not everyone who participates in an identity group, for example, has the same socioeconomic status. Jaden Smith, Will Smith's son would be an example, or OJ Simpson or what have you. Now, that doesn't mean that the mode statistically of people don't fall into certain categories, but you can't assume that because someone is white, a poor person in, in the Appalachians, that they have any kind of substantive advantage. Um, in, in fact, quite quite the contrary. So in a sense that this orthodoxy has bartered socioeconomic status for identity markers. And I think that traditional leftism has wanted to level the field in terms of ec the economic hierarchy. And now one of the things that you see happening is the, the people who are in the orbit of woke ideology want to level the field in terms of the privilege hierarchy. And, and, and those, I mean, look, it is a fact that some people have certain unearned privileges and it is a fact that some people just get to use a vulgarity. They just get shafted. I mean, there's just no question about it. The, we have the answers to that and the answers are equality of opportunity, for example, fixing our school system and, and giving. So here's my question to you. I don't know how it is on, on your island, but have, have uh, it's an, an in-joke, the island reference. But, <laughs> yeah, but I love as, what you call Australia on our yeah. island. You could call it a continent, which sounds more impressive. Here. <laughs> that is, that is actually very, that is far more impressive. Um, so with all this talk about equity, has there been a single instance of a school or a school system that's been fixed because of the talk of equity? I don't think so. And if you know of one, let me know. I haven't heard of one. So people are talking about equity and they're trying to jerry-rig the outcome. Meanwhile, uh, poor people, and, and again, I say poor people, and you can look at the, the overlap like Venn diagrams who happen to be, for example, African-American are still suffering and struggling in those school systems. And what have we done to help them? We've tried to jerry-rig the outcomes. What we should be doing is giving every, again, I'm speaking only for, for Americans, but I think this extends to the English speaking world and beyond. I do think this is a universal principle. We need to give all kids a public education of the first rate and not worry about jury-rigging the outcomes. Wouldn't the, the defender of equity say, well, you can say it hasn't succeeded, but this is a long struggle and there is no finish line. And we've only been trying this for the past three seconds in, in evolutionary time. And for most of history, uh, you know, black students, students of color have been, ha haven't had the same opportunities as white students. So it's time to redress that. You guess, so, so how? My, my, I think we already have an answer to that. And it's, to, to adequately fund schools in poor districts. This is not a mystery. This is not a secret. We know, and it's not just funding. It's a complex. Lyle Asher from, from Lewis and Clark has written extensively about this and other people. I mean, we know pretty much what works at this point. For example, we know phonics as opposed to whole language. I mean, we know discrete things that work and we need to start moving. Not only, it's not just a question of funding. I don't want to leave leave you with that impression, but it's a question of what are the best evidence-based practices, which is another problem with the ideology is you have a shift away from uh, objectivity and evidence and towards subject, which are considered white conceptions and patriarchal conceptions and towards lived experience. This it's, in philosophy is called a subjective turn, a turn away from the objective and turn toward the subjective with lived experiences. And that makes it incredibly difficult to put in evidence-based policies in our school systems. 
Among Let's talk about that because it, I mean, it's sort of a, it's, it, there are analogies there between the shift from a focus on are we being fair and just to the individual to a conception of are we being fair and just to this entire group, which may involve strategies that are actually unjust and unfair towards individuals because we're looking at group dynamics instead of the individual. And then in parallel, we've got this thing that you just alluded to, which is transitioning from, all right, let's look at the facts, let's look at the data, let's talk about the problem, let's assess what there's evidence for in terms of improving that problem to more of a this is my lived experience uh you right. as a insert identity here don't really have standing to talk about this because you couldn't possibly walk a mile in my shoes and so on and so forth and then essentially who even gets to talk about what solutions we should be considering becomes curtailed correct i, I want to go back to something you said before I, I think that the difference between individuals and groups is somewhat illusory for example, if you privilege one group, by definition, another group has to receive, this actually is systematic or systemic discrimination. You can't just privilege one. If there are only so many slots, for example, in, a, in Yale's, you know, um, 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 I would think of some STEM field, like um, engineering. If only, yeah, if there are only so many slots in, in civil engineering, for example, or particle physics or whatever, what have you. And by definition, you would have to discriminate against some groups of people. And, and again, you see this happening with Asians. So it's not like I'm, I'm making this up. This is the courts have legally decided this. So I'm, 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 you could and when you say this is happening to Asians, just to clarify, what you mean is that there are actually fewer Asians admitted into uh, top courses in the United States because they're being discriminated against because they would otherwise be a high, too high. No, because Kenny, they Hughes, Kenny, Kenny Hughes' book has written about this, just an inconvenient minority. It's an amazing book that I'd rec recommend reading. Um, no, it's not that fewer are admitted. It's actually that more are admitted. More Asians are admitted. I say this uh, also as a father of, 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 a, of a little girl who's, who's Asian and, and um, I'm also thinking. No, about I just this. mean fewer are admitted than would than would be if there were a colorblind admissions policy. That's correct. Yeah. So they have to raise the standards. So they raise the standards for some racial groups. So basically, it's a type of systemic discrimination against people. And my claim to you is that that is unfair, even if the reason is to redress past injustices. If you want to redress past injustices, the way to do it is to truly make the school system a first-rate school system and provide everybody with fun, tasty lunches education of the first rate breakfast you know i mean you'd really need to create the opportunities to allow people to flourish but we're not doing that we're too preoccupied um with uh, outcomes and we're preoccupied with social grievances and we're preoccupied with destroying or or ripping down a system instead of we, so the Aubrey Lord's phrase, I think, is very useful here. The master's tools cannot disable the master's house. You know, the master's, you can't dissemble the, the, ma the master's house is patriarchy, white supremacy, et cetera. The tools that built the house are reason, evidence, epistemic adequacy, science. And so all of those conceptions are um, considered to be null and void in terms of they just perpetuate the system. It's called privilege preserving epistemic pushback. You just threw in a word there, white supremacy, that I, I just want to pick up before we move on. Uh, it's a term you didn't hear very much five or ten years ago. It basically mm -hmm. meant people in white hoods carrying uh, flaming torches through the streets and, uh, and you know, neo-Nazis. Now white supremacy is everywhere and nowhere. Do you know what it means? Well, the semantic range of white supremacy has... Um expanded significantly for that. And Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay and cynical theories talk about this. It's an, it's a, it's an important point. And so there were, and there still are literal uh, Ku Klux Klan members. Fortunately, that's decreasing. There's some wonderful work, just parenthetically, by Daryl Davis on that. If you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend Daryl Davis's work. He's a black guy who goes in to speak to Klan's members, befriends them, and they give him their abnegated hoods. It's a, a utterly mind, like genuinely mind blowing. I don't know any other way to say it, but balls of steel. <laughs> you can um, say that. We're on an Australian prison island, apparently. So. Okay. <laughs> you can get away okay, with a little, a little saucy okay. language. 
All right, that's why I saw the language for today. So, um, so the range of that. So now I published an article, of, I think in 2014, that said privilege is the original sin. So it's a kind of whiteness is a kind of stain. And if you look at Ibrahim Kendi, Tahana Hasi Coates, Robin D'Angelo, there's something intrinsic to the property of whiteness that is or, or is is inherently racist. And John McWhorter and Coleman Hughes and Glenn Lowry have written very elegant, elegantly um, rebutting that. But that's the problem if you don't buy into disputation and argumentation and debate and dialectic is that you don't even listen to that. Why bother? You have your lived experience. Mm. Well, also, they're not real uh, people of color because they're not talking Correct. the way that the orthodoxy would require them to. I mean, I, you know, I have many of those people are my friends and the amount of shit that they have to put up with online about being called, you know, Uncle Tom's or something because Correct. they diverge from what they're supposed to think as good people of color is so, so Correct. So lived experience is only lived experience and we'll re relate this to diversity, which is very important. It's only lived experience if it comports with the narrative. So when you hear diversity, you're not merely diversity. When you hear diversity, just translate it as intellectual homogeneity. So, excuse me, Larry Elder, who's running for governor of California after the recall of Gavin Newsom, he is not considered to be a diverse candidate because he holds uh, um, views that just don't comport with the orthodoxy. So mm -hmm. even even there, when you're talking about what is diversity, you know, what what is what is the lived experience of a, well, the lived experience of a black man means he's not really. He's not a true black. I mean, what was the thing Biden said? Uh, you know, how, how can you I can't vote for Trump? You're not a true black. I, I can't remember what it was. He said something, something like, "If you don't vote for me, then you're not real. You're not really black." Yeah, something oh. utterly deranged. As if you know, you, you see the same thing with Muslims. You know, when people who aren't Muslims look at somebody and, and they paint the whole brush by the by the extremist section. So so someone's not a real Muslim unless they're blowing stuff up, right? So they. So it's a kind of injustice that they do toward people who believe. And in fact, you can be, I know that this is a hard, not, not for you, I hope, but you can be black and, or white or Jewish or Asian. You can be Asian, not good at math. You, a friend of mine I do jujitsu with told me a funny story. He was at a restaurant. He's a Korean. He's at a restaurant and uh, uh, they were divvying up the bill at the end and they just hand, they handed him the bill. He's like, what are you handing me the bill for? And everyone said, well, you're good at math. Like the assumption, the assumption was, he thought it was, he didn't think it was a microaggression. He thought it was really funny, but you know, you can be Asian and not be good at math. You can be black and be conservative. You can be white and have your identity marker tells you nothing about what you believe. That's right. And yet it does tell you something about some of the experiences that you might have had, which is what leads people to believe that they have greater standing to hold an opinion about something if they have a lived experience, right? I mean, I have just never experienced racism. I've experienced homophobia because I'm married to a man. I've experienced anti-Semitism because I'm, I'm a Jew. I, I, there are certain experiences that I've never had and when you talk about like oh what about the disadvantaged working class white person who is supposed right. who supposedly carries around this white privilege well right. then this person is not privileged on in econ economic sense but it is true to say that they have never faced the fact of racial discrimination for being a person of color right so i would i would put forth this so let's say that you aggregate the lived, again, but even to aggregate the lived experiences of people, you need to use some kind of science. You need to use surveys. You need to, you know, you're not, you, you just can't get around using the tools of science at some point, but okay, let's just go with it for a second. But even in those cases, if there's anti-Semitism or homophobia or some kind of um, a bigotry, what, just as, a, as, as a, a pedestrian, but important example in this country, because it comes up so frequently, are black people pulled over by the police more than white people? Right. This is not a difficult question to answer. In fact, it couldn't possibly be any simpler, barring some wrenches that are in there. You can use the tools of science to test that. So if black people say, well, look, this is you know, terrible. We're, we're being pulled over by the police and we don't like it. But you don't hear those complaints by white people. What you would do is then you could conduct a study on it, right? Like you could look at body cams and you could correlate because every time they pull someone over, they read the license uh, in, into a database. Like you can use the tools of science to figure out if those claims are true. And then you can make public policies say, okay, so this is a problem. So what do we do about it? You know, like how do we address these problems? But even then, the personal experience only leads you to 
think about what kind of tools of science you can impose to, to give policymakers the most accurate data before they make decisions. When things started erupting on university campuses, and I think one of the things, one of the incidents that a lot of people might recall is when Nicholas Christakis tried to appease uh, his students, uh, and you may just want to want to tell uh, a younger Australian audience what happened there. It, it sort of was a, a, an inciting incident, I suppose, in the university culture wars that have ended up with you in the position that you're in, which we'll get to in a moment. One of the things that one of the students yelled at him was, it's not your job to tell us what to know. It's your job to make us feel Correct. safe. And what you're talking about there about like uh, black people pulled over more than white people, you know, you can have questions about, you know, how, what proportion of the male population is committing domestic violence when you hear about Correct. allegations that all men are predators, you can have, you know, there are all these, and it's extremely sensitive to even broach these subjects because it sounds like you're being a defender of rapists or racists or worse. Uh, but it, when you actually, dig, when you're digging down into the data of, of, of this stuff there is a parallel conversation going on at the moment with a lot of people which is like who gives a shit about data this is my life we're talking about you know if i'm the girl who's shouting at nicholas christakis on, on university campus i want to feel as though i am safe right. and i want you as a partner in helping me to feel safe regardless right. of what data says thank you for saying that that's part of the defense mechanism of the ideology the ideology has multiple defense mechanisms not only to keep it in place but to keep other people from questioning the ideology at all. So um, racist is a tool that they have in the toolkit. If you contradict something, or harassment is another one for my former university, Portland State University published a, uh, or the faculty re resolution said that criticism of, and I'll be happy to send you this, these videos, at a faculty senate resolution that criticism of critical race theory is a type of harassment. And again, this is a public, because of the coronavirus, this, these were all recorded and placed on, on YouTube. And then they wanted the, they took it down and they wanted the National Association of Scholars to take down their commentary on it. One of my colleagues published a critique on, on myself and another faculty member that basically saying criticism of ideas is harassment. So when, when you criticize these ideas, you're harassing. I'm getting to your point. I, I published a piece in the Chronicle, criticism of ideas is not harassment. In fact, not only is it not harassment, it's the coin of the realm. This is what we do. We publish, we engage, we debate. So the ideology has certain things to keep it in place. One of the, Another thing is platforming, saying, oh, you're providing a platform, you're talking to someone who has an odious view. And not only that, there's, there's platforming by proxy. So it's not that you don't want to have a conversation with someone. They don't even want someone to have a conversation with you. So you're guilty mm -hmm. by association. So that all of those things keep the ideology from experiencing any external criticism. They keep it in place. Uh, safetyism now, so that's the, the contextual background for your question. So safetyism is another thing. And we see this all the time now. People say, I feel unsafe. Okay, so if you feel unsafe, you should probably take a creative writing class, right? An ethics class in philosophy is not the place for you, right? Maybe you should, you know, sing on a street corner with a guitar or something, but you, you, you really, to really make a substantive engagement of moral questions and moral issues, you have to take a sincere look at the other side. I mean, you just have to, because if you don't, you're validating the conclusions that you came in with in the first place. And the purpose of an educational institution, the purpose of an education period should not be to, to um, deepen people in the beliefs they have in that they come into the classroom. I mean, you know, you know Plato's book seven of the Republic, it's to lead people out of, right? Educare, to lead out of, to lead. It's not to put stuff in, it's to lead one out of a, a state of ignorance. And to do that, you have to have some kind of challenging of the beliefs that you have. If not, you're just kept in the cave. Where does safety is another, I mean, we're doing the greatest hits of words that have become abused in recent times. You, you right. mentioned equity and, you know, we, we went to diversity. Oh, diversity is also interesting because in the, in the States, I mean, I, this was a usage of the, of the term diversity that I hadn't quite encountered. But when I, when, when I was, I lived in the States for a while and one of the first periods that I was there, uh, I saw, I read a review about this great new diverse show, which was super diverse. And it was, I think it was blackish, where every single cast member is an right. African American. Correct. And I turned it on and I didn't even understand. I thought there must have been a mistake because diverse right. would mean people from lots of different 
culture Correct. as much intended and there was just it was the least diverse show on television in terms Correct. of the strict meaning of the of the word but that's just another another way that words change and safety is another one now that we've we've come yeah here. and you know and safety, let's yeah. let's can we can i can, so, so, so can i also put another one that dovetails with safetyism that that will help us understand safetyism is inclusion so i have a, a series of videos that i'm putting out now uh will be out next month i have a a, a non-profit that I just started since I left my job, National Progress Alliance. And one of the first things that I'm trying to do is to clarify the meanings of words. And I do this in 60 seconds in very basic language. So let's, let me prep to see how good this is. Um, okay. So inclusion basically means, it doesn't mean what you think it means. So, you, so maybe you know, because you're in this space, but ask someone in the, in the crew over there what they think inclusion means. And they'll probably almost definitely tell you, well, you know, including different people. That's not what inclusion means tell you what inclusion means. Inclusion from the literature means making people feel safe, making people feel welcome. If people are not welcome, they do not feel safe. How do we make people feel safe? Well, how do we make them feel unsafe? How do we make them feel unwelcome? Well, if somebody says something that is offensive to somebody or bothers someone or disturbs someone, then they won't feel welcome. But we want people to feel welcome. So inclusion means restricted speech. That's what inclusion means. Every time you hear the word inclusion, you should translate that in your head as restricted speech, because that's the only way people can feel welcome is if you restrict their speech. Do, and that's, that, that's a that, form of safety. Isn't the counterpoint to that, well, we're restricting speech, but we're restricting hate speech. We're creating an inclusive space. And if you, know, if you want to come in here peddling homophobia, transphobia, racism, and so on, then we'll exclude that. But that's in the service of a more inclusive environment. Yeah, that's the, I'll be very blunt with you. That's the kind of um, thinking that people who, are, they're, they're using a, a, a blunt instrument and they haven't truly thought about it. And it's a pretty easy line to make. If something is an immutable property of a person, then don't criticize it. But all ideas should be criticized. For example, I have gray hair. That's an immutable property. I'm 55 years old. That's an immutable property. Because I can't change it, there's no point in criticizing it. I'm heterosexual. I can't change that. I never like, oh, you know, at 15, I've decided I've made this thought. And, but even if I could make that thoughtful decision, there's a difference between a property of a, an immutable property of a person and an idea. And we need to be absolutely ruthless with ideas. And um, there's no criticism of immutable properties of people because they can't change them. Right, but some ideas make people who possess certain immutable properties uncomfortable because it would leave them with the 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 short end of the of the stick, uh, so to speak. Like if if, oh, if you were in an example. environment in which people were saying that someone of your age and your hair color should not receive the same tax benefits as everybody else, then you would feel like that was not an inclusive place for you. I'll tell you a quick story. A few years ago, I tried an experiment. This was before the pandemic. Um, I had white hair back then as well. Um, they, they, they don't call it gray hair anymore. They call it silver hair. I like that because I can just see it coming on the side. So I'm gonna do it <laughs> yeah, they call it silver. Hair. So I tried an experiment just, just for fun. I think it's the first time I ever told anybody this, but um, I like to stretch because I think stretching is important. And I, I go to a local gym here uh, it's like a, one of those, it's like the McDonald's of gyms and they have basketball courts everywhere. And I would always sit on the basketball court just as an experiment stretching to see if I would get picked in. And then I would tell people I don't want to play because I was just more interested in stretching, but it was an experiment. It was for science. So what I would do is I would see when I would get picked and invariably I'd either get picked dead last or I wouldn't get picked at all. Now the, the question is, if your goal is to win, is it unfair? Is it unjust to not pick me because of my immutable characteristics? Well, the, the answer, that's the kind of exactly the kind of thing that you need to have a conversation about. And if you cannot have a conversation about whether or not you look, the, the solution to all of this is have a conversation, is have a dialogue, is to kind of make a moral infrastructure from which you can formulate your public policies. But that moral infrastructure, like when you started the conversation about equity, that moral infrastructure has to be rooted in rationally derivable principles or, or it's just arbitrary. You're basically just making shit up. 
right? Mm. So we need to have a, um, a way to think, okay, well, that's a person. What if I say, you know, what, what if some evidence comes out that there are racial differences in IQ? Does that mean that we don't let people from a certain country in? Or for certain, or, or from your continent. See, I've elevated you to a continent. We found. Thank that, you so much. I appreciate okay. the upgrade. <laughs> you know, we found <laughs> that people from Australia or whatever you usually be racial groups, but I was just saying that because it makes it more palatable. So, does that mean we don't have that conversation? Does that mean that that's just off the table? So here's the here's the consequence of not having that conversation when confronted with data. Somebody, there will be people who are more than willing, not only to have that conversation, but to come in with answers to those problems. So there will be people almost always on the extreme political spectrum who have answers or will claim to have answers to those questions. And if you've not prepared yourself for how to have those conversations, those that's my book, How to Have Impossible Conversations, then you simply won't know what to say. And that's the situation in which we find ourselves now, although with less uh, morally contentious and difficult topics, with even the mm -hmm. lowest of low-hanging fruit, we're producing generations of students, I think a generation and a half at this point, who are utterly incapable um, of, of um, making, of even knowing what the other side is to have a substantive rebuttal of those criticisms. And that's a problem for all of us because they're bringing that into the classroom. Yeah, I mean, and I think you've, you've really hit on the, the, the crux of things there, because even if people don't care about being intellectually rigorous, and even if they only want their own side to win, and they want safetyism and comfort and inclusion to take dominance over difficult conversations, at the end of the day, their side isn't going to win if they don't know how to articulate their position uh, in, on, against the, thing, the things that they, they disagree with. Um, this reminds me a little bit of, of the sense of, of safety or unsafety around gay the gay marriage debate that took place right. in Australia in, in 2017, unlike the United States, where it was a, a judicial decision here, it was a referendum, and everybody voted. And, you know, there, was a, there were a lot of people saying, this makes me feel unsafe, uh, as a member of the LGBTQI plus community, this is, uh, you know, you know, there should not even be a conversation, this should not be a conversation, because this is a human right. And my position was always, how do you know that it's a human right unless you talk about why it's a human right and hear the people who don't think that it's a human right? And so I had the Archbishop of Sydney on my radio show and we, you know, hashed it out. He didn't have any very good reasons as to why it shouldn't, why gay marriage shouldn't exist. But the existence of the conversation, whilst difficult, was more valuable than my remaining safe. Correct. And, and that's what, so you handle that like an adult, right? You, you had him on and, and Hey, listen, awesome that he came on your show. Right. I mean, that's fantastic. So kudos to him and kudos to people who are honest with you. And they say, you know, someone says, I don't like gays. I don't think they should be married. That's a, you might disagree with them, but that's a person who's honest. You can have conversations with people who are honest like that, but when people are well, obfuscating, I mean, the, the, the other, lying, the other thing, Peter, the other bait and switch that happens is that if the person does like gays, but just doesn't think that they should be married because they have right. a religious objection to that, you know, you know, they want to preserve that particular institution, but they're not at right. all homophobic, that position is now erased from the the landscape altogether and that person is by definition a homophobe, you know, similarly, right. if you don't, you know, if you if you dispute what should be done, maybe uh, to address racial inequalities then you are by definition a racist, even if you're definitely not a racist, which brings us to that word. We've talked about these other words that are okay. getting used. I just want to come back to white supremacy uh, and racism. Okay. All right. So you just, you just said so much there. I think we need, <laughs> we need to, we, we can disambiguate terms in a minute. Let's, let's slow down. Okay. So we know, we know that the way to come about consensus and move forward in a democracy we know it's to ha it's town halls. It's to hash out issues. It's I'm not a fan of debating myself because I think that it forces people to stick to a conclusion that they they think might be wrong. And so there's a kind of a win element. And so I think conversations are far better than debate. But OK, whatever debate uh, conversation. Have, we know that's that's we need that to move forward, just like when you had the bishop on. And again, good for the bishop for coming on. I think the first thing I would have said to him is thank you for coming on my show. I really appreciate it. 
Um, mm -hmm. Because right now we have people who simply won't talk to you about anything. They're completely convinced they know the right answers to moral questions. Mm -hmm. And so how do we address that problem? So that is not an epistemic problem. That's a moral problem. That's a problem of, as Jonathan Haidt says, uh, in The Righteous Mind, that morality binds and blinds. Morality binds and blinds. So to solve that problem, we need to change the moral mind about how people view dialogue and safetyism. And what's happening now is this idea that they think that they should feel safe is trumping the idea to have honest, open, civil conversations. Was that clear? That was absolutely clear. Now let's take that to the next uh, <laughs> the next All component right. of my multi-pronged octopus of a, of a question, okay. which was about racism, white supremacy, and those terms. Okay. So the meaning of racism has changed. We, we, we've brought in power to the equation, whereas before it was discriminating against someone on an individual on the basis of a racial stereotype. That was what the definition has been for a long time. And I think there's, there ought to be, that's a rationally drivable idea that this ought to be universally morally um, um, repudiated and, and, and it is fundamentally odious, but you've added the idea of power. And when you add the idea of power, you, again, from the postmodern notions and the best, really the best source for this is Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay's cynical theories, which I mentioned before. When you add the notion of power into the equation, it completely changes it. So for example, that's why on this new definition, people in the majority or people in positions of power, like white people, um, only they can be racist, but people absent that power cannot be racist, like, for example, uh, trans people, what have you, in the oppression hierarchy. And so that's a meaning of, of, of a word that's recently changed. I mean, look, you can ask, well, what about, what about white farmers in Zimbabwe? They don't have power. I mean, you, you can just think of some pretty, pretty simple um, examples um, of, of how to work through this. But again, that's maybe that's the emerging theme in this conversation. In order to even do that, you have to know what the opposing side is. You have to know what the best, and not just a straw man, that's why it's good that you invited the bishop. Like you have to invite in really smart people who are true believers to have those conversations with them. And that is not happening in the university. What is happening in the university? It's, it's lost its North Star, or its North Star has ceased becoming truth and becoming uh, an ideology mill. And so, for example, the president of Portland State University has said, Stephen Percy has said that the, the um, primary, something like, I think is that the, the primary mission of the organization, I think that's the quotation, but look it up, is um, racial justice. Really? That's, he said this publicly, that's the primary mission of the universe, not balanced budgets, not teaching excellence, not research, not, I mean, that, that's an absolutely astonishing statement. And so, look, when, when you have a, when, when, when there is a primary purpose of an organization, every other purpose is subordinate to the primary purpose. So if there's a conflict, so for example, like in, in, in the Bible, if there's a conflict between, you know, commandments, they're, they're not hierarchically organized. Whereas just to, to John Rawls, uh, oh, okay, let me take it back. John Rawls' theory of justice has principles that are hierarchically organized. I'd like to take a moment that I, I've, I've been meaning to say this for a while. I really wanted to thank Alan for this series, uh, the Dean. And I think that's, you know, when Dean Davidson even puts these things together, that's trying to change a culture in which reorients the institution's North Star toward truth, right? Toward open dialogue, toward the free of exchange of ideas. Because people want, students are coming to the university not to deepen the beliefs they already have, but to learn, to question, to challenge, et cetera. Okay, so back to the, the if the North Star of the institution is, is uh, racial justice, then if there's a conflict, then the primary mission of the university has to trump that. So if the conflict, for example, is with free speech, then that's always subordinate to racial justice. So every time you come out and say, well, this is a, 
the, the primary mission of the institution is racial justice, you're basically telling people exactly what you feel about free speech. And that's what they did in the faculty resolution. And that's why they're claiming that criticism of critical race theory, for example, is harassment. Well, they have to do that because how else are they going to buttress the idea that the primary mission of the university is racial justice? And, so, and that's the other thing. That, that's the other thing. One more thing on that. The, um, the, further your, the further one's belief is from being rationally drivable, the more slack you have to make to keep the belief in place. So for example, if you want to forward a moral idea that is not, um, if, if, if you, let's say you're forwarding an idea, doesn't even matter what the idea, abortion, or it doesn't even matter what the idea is, and you're extremely confident that the idea is true, like on a one to 10, you're 9.9 .9 confidence, but you only have sufficient reason and evidence to get you to like a five or a six, then that slack has to be made up somehow in, the Islamic world, it would be, you know, a blasphemy law in the university. It'd be, it would be a speech restriction or political um, correctness, or you can claim to be offended or, but, but you have to systems of, of belief have to make up that slack somehow. That's a fascinating definition of what offense is. I haven't thought about it that way, but that's quite nice, isn't it? To interpret, uh, what one's offendedness as a way of bridging the gap between what they can logically argue and the the emotional component of their Correct. response. Correct. Hmm. How did you get yourself into the pickle that you're in, or should I say the liberty and freedom that you now enjoy? Tell us about how your trajectory of having run-ins with academia began. I like the latter framing. Much better. I'm, I'm much, <laughs> I'm much happier now. I'll give you I, that framing if you give me a continent. I'll give you that. I'll give. I was gonna. I was gonna end the interview by by giving you that. I'll tell <laughs> my friends, my friends, that immediately. Um, I. Oh, and the other thing is, if anybody wants, speaking of my friends on the on your continent, uh, Mike Nana N A Y N A has a wonderful series that that bridges the gap between the theoretical and the practical with his videos of, of Brett, Brett and Heather from Evergreen and some of the madness that's consuming the universities, but he does a meticulous job in documenting those and I, I, they're free on, on YouTube. I'd highly recommend those. So I got in, it, 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 truly, it just by asking questions. I just was curious about these new orthodoxies. I was just curious about these new policies and I couldn't and actually, Peter, maybe we just back us up about how you got into academia, what you wanted to do, what interested you as, uh, oh, as a, sure. a young guy. Yeah, what did you want to do with your life? What did I want to do with my life when I was a young guy? Uh, say not a young guy anymore. So what did I want to do with my life? Um, uh, I, wa I, wanted to, I wanted to explore ideas. I wanted to figure out what was true. And, and as I went al along that path, I figured out that what... The, the, I, I figured out that the process of figuring out what was true was more important than figuring out what was true because it's very easy to, uh, as Feynman says, the easiest person to fool is yourself. So you have to make sure that you have a rigorous process. And so one of the things subsequently to that, that I've learned is I almost never ask somebody why they believe something anymore. I, I know that this is a heresy. But one of the things that I've learned from studying belief for my whole life, is writing about it, reading about it, delving into the literature about it, is that when you ask somebody why they believe something, they'll give you reasons for why they believe it. And what they're actually, what's actually happening in that process is they're talking themselves into a higher confidence level because they're hearing themselves talk about why they believe what they believe. But hmm. what you should be doing is giving them the gift of doubt. Is is enabling them to is enabling them to doubt their own confidence in their beliefs, and you do that with a very simple question: Under what conditions would you be willing to change your mind? Like, what evidence would I have to show you to change your mind? When you do that, people don't talk themselves into their own into more, particularly in the moral domain, more confidence. So I got I got into philosophy. I've always loved Socrates. I love. I used to read the Platonic Dialogues as a kid. I got into it through the Socratic method. 
um, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced, I just did an interview and someone said, what's the greatest, the greatest technology that we have, the greatest invention of humanity? And I said, there's just no question, this is Socratic method, just hands down. Um, and so I was fascinated by this idea of how do we come to truth? How do we figure out what's true? And, and what, and talk- Peter, just pause there. What is the Socratic method? Oh, it's a way of, of asking uh, questions. All, Socrates does it with other people, but ultimately it's a way of asking questions to your, toward yourself. And so a way of asking you if your beliefs are, um, if, if you believe that what you, what you claim to believe. So it has five stages. You know, it begins in wonder, and then somebody will pose a hypothesis, like what is justice? You're wondering. Justice in the, the hypothesis, justice is paying your debts. And then it has an Alinkus or a counterexample. And someone, the next thing was, this is from Plato's Republic, first three books of the Republic. Someone will say, well, uh, what, if I, what if I borrow a knife? Well, maybe in this modern context would be a gun. What if I borrow a gun from somebody who later becomes criminally insane? Do I give him back the knife? Then you go to the next stage. Yes, you do. Okay, then we've, we've held that as provisionally true or no, you don't, so then you go back with another hypothesis. It's a way of thinking through difficult questions, honestly it's so, and sincerely. It's so alien to the, com- to, to the state of conversation at the moment in our hyper-partisan, hysterical, Twitter-fied uh, discourse. Co- correct, that's because people aren't, a, a lot of reasons for that, but social media has contributed to it, but we, we, have, we have lost the sense of truth. We've lost understanding why that's important. And the moral mind in many senses was overriding the rational mind and we're seeing the consequences of that everywhere. When you say we've lost the sense of truth, I'm just trying to imagine the pushback to that. And the pushback I suppose would be, we are seeing a demotion of a very uh, stuffy old fashioned, narrow data driven uh, scientific version of truth in favor of bigger moral truths like the great arc of oppression that certain groups have endured and we're trying to remedy those what do you make of that well that's martin luther king's idea the moral arc bends towards justice and michael Shermer's written a wonderful book and stephen pinker's better angel better angels of our nature he writes about that very eloquently I don't, I don't see even those conclusions themselves were brought on by, in the case of Shermer and Pinker, rigorous scholarship. And so, look, have there been injustices? Yes. Have there been narrow focuses on, uh, or, or has there been a too, too narrow of a focus on, I don't know, some aspect of, of you know, human well-being or what have you? Yeah, sure. But all of the answers to those questions have to take place within a framework of reason, rationality, and evidence. And the farther you stray from reason, rationality, and evidence, the more arbitrary your beliefs become. Okay, so let's loop back to you. You're a, uh, you're a Socratic nerd boy who's, <laughs> who loves this, uh, this stuff as a younger man, and you go into academia, and you begin, uh, yeah, you, you begin where and teaching what? Well, I taught in the prisons for my dissertation. Um, I used the Socratic method to uh, help prison inmates to reason morally and think critically and thus desist from criminal behavior. So not just not not go back in, in other words, not recidivate, but to actually desist and stop criminal behavior by making, by making better moral decisions, by giving them the tools to do that for themselves, to, to self-empower them. And so um, then I've been teaching, I've been teaching at many, many universities for many years online. I've been teaching um, on ground. I've taught just many, many, many universities. And where did you start getting a sense that things were going awry? That's a really good question. I, I, I thought initially that uh, when I started teaching at Portland State, that there must just be a lot of people who had mental health issues because of the way they were acting. I never connected that to anything larger, like any any um, zeitgeist or system problem initially, maybe like 2011, 2012. Um, and, and then slowly over time, I started to put the pieces together. What was happening? 
what was happening? What, how can I possibly explain this? Okay, what was happening? Um, the institution was being engulfed by certain moral principles that were overriding traditional educational conceptions of, of, of what an ed education is and why it matters. That's the broad, that's the low def version of what was happening. How did you respond? By asking questions. What's the evidence for this? I'm unclear. Under what conditions would you be willing to revise the belief that trigger warning, safe spaces and microaggressions are, are good for kids? Um, I remember once I was at a faculty meeting and I asked one of the main proponents of this, a very sincere question. I said, do you, and I'm, I got to be careful because I'm, I'm trying intentionally not to dox anybody. I said, do you, you know, do you really believe? And because I'm curious, this guy's a, I'm, I'm trying not to say, <laughs> he had all the credentials to make any reasonable person be like, wow. I said, do, do, do you, do you believe that in, it's only been in the last five years of, you know, 2,400 years of recorded history that we've figured out that cultural appropriation is wrong? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, so, so nobody thought of that before, or that was never in Kant or never in, in any of the, even the obscure thinkers or never. And he said, yes, I do. And so um, from those conversations, and to his credit, he said that as opposed to being offended or accusing me of a microaggression, which has happened on, on so many occasions. Uh, so, so I started to see this madness uh, overtake my my colleagues and overtake public policies in the administration. And I started to see the weaponization of offices in the university against dissonant voices. And uh, all along the way, I just kept thinking, well, geez, you know, maybe there's something I don't understand. Like I just, this was, you know, before the conceptual penis. You know, this, maybe there's just something I don't get here. And so I just kept, uh, I'd go to a diversity panel and everybody had the same opinion. I'm like, wow, what kind of diversity panel is that? So I just didn't, I wasn't figuring it out. And I started asking questions. And the more questions I had, I could tell by the responses from people that something wasn't right. Instead of just answering the question, almost anything else would happen. So that's what really tipped me off. So let's, let's talk about what's happened now then you've resigned I in have. your resignation letter you said that the university has basically become a place that takes in grievances and victimization and puts out a certain ideology on the world rather than a place for yep. critical free thinking what yep. was the straw that broke the camel's back oh i tell you exactly what the moment is so 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 the camel was i'm trying to extend that a little bit so the camel <laughs> the camel was weighed down by by an astonishing amount of straw. <laughs> I think that the, the, uh, the one moment that made me realize that I, I couldn't do it anymore was I had really tried to make a meeting with the president of the university and he refused to meet with me. And I said, look, five minutes. And his staff kept saying, oh, he's too busy. He can't do it. He's too busy. Um, so I managed to get like just a very brief meeting with the dean in my college. And I I said to the dean, I said, you know, Portland State University made the list the, from Greg Lukianoff's, he wrote The Calling of the American Mind with Jonathan Haidt, that he has an organization called FIRE, F-I-R-E, Foundation of Individual Rights and in Education, and Portland State University made the list of the worst colleges for freedom of speech. And he said to me with, I shouldn't have said he, edited out the he, and this person said to me with total sincerity, it's a good thing to be on those lists. And that utterly blew my mind. Like, because up to that point, I had, I had believed to at least to a certain extent, let me repeat that. So, I, so that utterly blew my mind because up until that point, I naturally assumed that this was a horrible bug of the system, but not a feature. And he's telling me, um, and this individual is telling me that this is a feature of an actual feature of the system. 
And it just blew my mind. And then I said, I cannot be complicitous anymore. I'm compromising my integrity. I mean, I knew at that point, but I always justified it to myself to think, well, if I left, who would the students have, right? Who would be pushing back on this? But at that point, I just realized, well, it was that, that was really the point, but then it was just the constant investigations. I mean, the last investigation was so fucking insane that I just, it was just like, that's it. Like, okay, you want, you're really trying to throw me out in disgrace. I got it. Like, I got it. I was on this call. They were upset that on my Twitter feed, I used the word investigation. And they, they started, they were claiming that to, to use the word investigation, you need um, to go to the IRB to get some kind of permission from human subjects. And I just, and I said, well, I'm doing this as a private citizen. I'm not, I'm not doing this. And the, an individual who was on the call, I will not name the individual, said, yeah, but at the time of my, my Twitter feed, I had my, a link to my book, How to Have Impossible Conversations. Now I have my website. He said, yeah, but this individual said, yeah, but if you go to the, if you click on your book and then you scroll down to the author page, it says Portland State University in your bio. And I, I just realized like at that point, I just realized what, like you are digging, like you right. are. So they made, they basically really made life digging. untenable. They made life impossible for you essentially. Well, well yeah. And for what, for, 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 for what, why, I mean, you know, I've been criticized a lot. Oh, you should have stayed there or you should have left earlier or you, you should like, look, man, I did the best that I could and I'm constantly being harassed all over the place. I have, but, but I also want to make something extremely clear. I am not a victim in this. I am not a victim in this. I fought back against a bunch of things. I fought back against in the liberal censorious ideology. I fought back against the people who hired me to do a job that prevented me, that they themselves prevented me from doing. I fought back to, against the institution and ultimately I lost. Like there was only so much I can do. I brought in diverse speakers to challenge the orthodoxy. I had, I mean, I could go on, but there was simply no point to just stay there indefinitely. I mean, why, why would I want to subject myself to that? It's a form of insanity. So uh, Peter, what do you think is going to happen in the longer term and in the broader picture here? I mean, universities have historically tried to play a role of being a place where you can argue for anything, you can say anything. It's a, it's a, it's a, hot, it's a hot bed of different ideas, of crazy ideas where you know, the misfits can come and flesh things out and try to figure out what's true. If, as you say, they're now becoming places that are committed to the opposite of that ideal, to, at least in your experience, a, a place that, that Many quite others openly too. values an antipathy towards free speech in favour of racial equity or, or justice or whatever they conceive it to be, right. then what becomes of universities? Well, I, I don't have an answer to that question. I mean, I can, I can speculate. E either the ideology will burn itself out, and in which case you will see an absolutely historically unprecedented gaslighting where you, you'll have people say, I never believe that. I never believe that. I just had nothing to do with it. So the ideology will burn itself out, which I think it will. It's, I'm, I'm sure it will. I don't know the damage it will do to the institutions, but it, 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 it is inherently unsustainable because for an ideology to sustain itself, and it either needs some kind of a state power or state control in which they mandate the, have some kind of a speech code or speech restrictions. And ultimately that has to be by force. So they could try to do that. There are technological fixes around that. But in order to keep an ideology in place, its proponents need an apologia. They need a, a defense of the faith. Like they, needed, they need to know the opposite sides of the argument. They need a, a first Peter 315. They don't have that. So the ideology is inherently unsustainable. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I think what you'll see happening is exactly what's happening now is that parallel architectures will emerge in which there are, just as in the, in the 90s, the media empires were crumbling. Now today, the internet is revolutionizing and changing things. And particularly with the pandemic, it ex it's expedited that. So we don't really need to work or teach from home anymore. So I think that one of the things that you'll see happening is the emergence of new institutions. And I welcome those institutions to, to give people a choice from the corruption that we, we have now. I also think that the legitimate, legitimacy, if we, you had, I wish you had asked me, asked me this a few years ago, would have given the same answer now, but 
it, it's less, it seems less prescient now that I know the outcome. The, leg, the legitimacy crisis will deepen the crisis of confidence in our institutions, you know, like pe people, conservatives, for example, fundamentalist evangelical conservatives will come up to me and when, I, when I'll talk about global climate change and they'll say, well, wh why should I believe that? You know, 99% of all donate, this is uh, true from the National Association of Scholars, donations to uh, political parties from Portland State University, and you can, I urge you to fact check this, was for, to the Democratic Party. So we know most professors are liberal. So why, this is just a bunch of liberal people. That's the other reason we need a diversity, ideological diversity in our institutions. And so when people point to these bodies of literature and scholarships, look, this guy's a Muslim, this is a, a Mormon, this guy's gay, this guy's straight, this guy's, uh, but they also have these views that it's not just a bunch of liberals telling you that the earth's warming is anthropogenic. So anyway, so I think you're going to see a deeper, um, I think you're, you're going to see a deeper um, crisis of legitimacy in, in, in our institutions. I don't, I don't, I think we'll survive it, but, um, but I'm more pessimistic now than I've ever been without question. When you say, Peter, that the ideology will burn itself out because one reason why it, it might not would be if it had state-sanctioned power enforcing speech codes and, and so Correct. on. My worry is that you don't need the state there and that there can be a self-enforcement mechanism where ideas... I mean, we've seen throughout history in so many different places where there's a kind of a, a, an elevation of a certain groupthink or a mythology and to transgress becomes an almost uh, quasi blasphemous experience and you just get Correct. shunned. You know, corporations just yeah. uh, don't want to have to deal with people who are squeaky wheels. And so they, they fire people for racism if the person yeah. was just articulating a difference of opinion about, uh, you know, quotas or something. And, and it, okay. it becomes a self-perpetuating cultural okay. phenomenon. So this is, this is going to take a long time. Hold on. Just, <laughs> just, hold on one second, because I have another interview. This is going to take a long time. Let's see if I can do this very, very You can quickly. make this the last. You can make your response here the last time. No, no, I'll give you one more after this. We'll end on something hopeful. So the problem is that the... I can't just walk in and teach in a K through 12 system. I don't know about on your continent, if you can do that, but uh, on this continent, you need to go through teacher certification programs. All of those teacher certification programs now have been compromised by woke ideology. They're all predicated on one book, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. You teach for liberation. You teach to overcome oppression. So even if you had a wand and you could wave the wand and you take out all wokeism out of the K-12 system, it would repopulate with people who have been indoctrinated from the existing K-12 and for Australians, K, K through 12 is just the, the, the primary and secondary school system, We're kindergarten to year 12. Okay. All right. so, so, so we have a problem with the ideology is not going away anytime soon, as long as the colleges of education are controlled. And I would urge you to read Lyle Asher, he's a prof A S H E R. he's a professor um, of, of, at Lewis and Clark. He's, he does some wonderful work on colleges of education. So we have a complex set of problems in which there is a moral value, a moral imperative that people don't know the other side of the issue or they're not taught the other side of the issue. And to even get published, to enable you to get tenure, you have to publish morally fashionable things. You simply cannot publish something that goes against the dominant moral orthodoxy. Now, oh, also on your continent, Peter Singer has the Journal of Controversial Ideas. Maybe that will emerge as something. But right now, this is the situation we're looking at. That was an example of a parallel architecture that I was talking about. So it would be uh, outside of the traditional norm or the mainstream. And as those, um, those norms have broken down, new norms will, will emerge. The decentralization, uh, um, you see that happening. So I don't uh, hold up much hope for the university system in its current incarnation. I think that people, there's been an erosion of confidence and public trust in those institutions, and that will continue. And the people in power are um, either in the orbit of the ideology or they're true believers and they have jobs for life and they hire people who also, now they have, they want diversity statements. So <clears throat> the problem is actually getting worse. I don't know when our engines of knowledge production are compromised. If you think America's bad, wait until you see the new hedge mod. All right, let's end on an optimistic note. Uh, what's, the, uh, what's the best thing about free speech? Enables you to figure out what's true. 
and it even enables you to figure out why you need free speech. It's in any society absent. Let me, let me phrase it to you positively. Um, yeah, the best thing about free speech is that it enables you to figure out what's true. And it's free. You just have to be honest with yourself and find a person with whom you can have conversations in which it's okay. To, you can let friends be wrong. You don't have to agree on everything. It's completely okay if you and your friends have a disagreement. In fact, it's actually good because then you can test and challenge each other's beliefs and good faith from a position of friendship. And what's your advice to young people who feel that they have to tread on eggshells about what they think and they can't flesh out complicated ideas for fear that they're going to trigger some tripwire and uh, you know, attract the ire of people who accuse them of thinking the wrong thing or peddling hate speech? Your integrity is worth more than that. Always speak honestly and bluntly with people and be open with, with them. The only way that you can have relationships that matter is that if you speak honestly. If you're not honest with someone, then they won't know what you mean. And so they'll formulate a relationship with someone who they think you are, but who you are not. And so if you want an actual relationship that's based on virtue and trust, then you have to be open and honest with people. The consequence of that, of course, is that you'll see it as bad, particularly if you're young, because you'll lose all of your friends. But they weren't your friends in scare quotes. They were people who just happened to be convenient. Your friends are the people who love you and the people who will tell you if you say something wrong or they disagree with, and that won't challenge the, the, the basis of the relationship. So stand up and fight back and be bold. The Greeks called parahesia, speaking truth in the face of danger. Things are worth fighting for. Relationships are worth fighting for. Reason is worth fighting for. Evidence is worth fighting for. Free speech is worth fighting for. So make a choice to not be a coward and fight back and speak boldly. Peter Bogosian, it's great to talk to you. Take care. Thanks. I appreciate it.